Book 6, Odysseus and Nausicaa. While much enduring Lord Odysseus slept there, overcome with weariness and sleep, Athena went to the land of Phaeacians to their city into the palace of the king, Lord Alcinous, to arrange a journey home for brave Odysseus. She moved into a wonderfully furnished room where a young girl slept, one like immortal goddesses in form and loveliness. She was Nausicaa, daughter of the great-hearted Alcinous. Like a gust of wind, Athena slipped over to the young girl's bed, stood by her head, then spoke to her. Her appearance changed to look like Demas' daughter, a young girl the same age as Nausicaa, whose heart was well disposed to her. In that form, bright-eyed Athena spoke out and said, Nausicaa, how did your mother bear a girl so careless? Your splendid clothes are lying here uncared for, and your wedding day is not so far away when you must dress up in expensive robes and give them to your wedding escort, too. You know it's things like these that help to make a noble reputation among men and please your honored mother and father. Come, at daybreak, let's wash out the clothing. Ask your noble father to provide you this morning early a wagon and some mules so you can carry the bright coverlets, the robes, and sashes. That would be better than going on foot because the washing tubs stand some distance from the town. As soon as dawn on her splendid throne arrived and woke fair-robed Nausicaa, she was curious about her dream, so she went to the house. Nausicaa went to stand close by her father and then spoke to him. Dear father, can you prepare a high wagon with dirty wheels for me so I can carry my fine clothing out and wash it in the river? It's lying here all dirty. It is appropriate for you to wear fresh garments on your person when you're with our leading men in council. You have five dear sons living in your home. Two are married, but three are now young men, so unattached, and they always require fresh washed clothing when they go out dancing. All these things I have to think about. Nausicaa said these words because she felt ashamed to remind her father of her own happy thoughts of getting married, but he understood all that and answered, saying, I have no objection, my child, to providing meals for you or any other thing. Go on your way. Slaves will get a four-wheeled wagon ready with a high box framed on top. Once he said this, he called out his slaves, and they did what he ordered. They prepared a smooth-running wagon made for mules, led up the animals, and then yoked them to it. Nausicaa brought her fine clothing from her room. She placed it in the polished wagon bed. Her mother loaded on a box full of all sorts of tasty food. She put in delicacies as well and poured some wine into a goat skin. The girl climbed on the wagon. With a clatter of hooves, the mules moved quickly off, carrying the clothing, and the girl, not by herself, for her attendants went with her as well. When they reached the stream of the fair-flowing river, the girls picked up the clothing from the wagon, carried it in their arms down to the murky water, and trampled it inside the washing trenches, each one trying to work more quickly than the others. Once they washed the clothes and cleaned off all the stains, they laid the items out in rows along the seashore, right where the waves which beat upon the coast had washed the pebbles clean. Once they had bathed themselves and rubbed their bodies well with oil, they ate a meal beside the river mouth, waiting for the clothes to dry in the sun's warm rays. When they'd enjoyed their food, the girl and her attendants threw their head scarves off to play catch with a ball, and white-armed Nausicaa led them in song. But when the princesses, princess threw the ball at one of those attendants with her, she missed the girl and tossed it in the deep and swollen river. They gave a piercing cry, which woke up Lord Odysseus. So he sat up, thinking in his heart and mind, Here's trouble. In this country I have reached, what are the people like? Are they violent and wild, without a sense of justice? Or are they kind to strangers? In their minds, do they fear the gods? A young, a young woman's shout rang out around me. Nymphs who live along steep mountain peaks and by the river springs and grassy meadows. Could I somehow be near men with human speech? Come on, then. I'm going to find, try to find out for myself. With these words, Lord Odysseus crept out of the thicket. With his strong hands, he broke off from thick bushes a leafy branch to hold across his body and conceal his sexual organs. He emerged, moving just like a mountain lion which relies on its own strength. Though hammered by the rain and wind, it creeps ahead, its two eyes burning, coming in among the herd of sheep or cattle or stalking a wild deer. His belly tells him to move in against the flocks, even within a well-built farm. That how Odysseus was coming out to meet these fair-haired girls, although he was stark naked. He was in great distress, but caked with brine, he was, fe he was a fearful sight to them, and they ran off in fear and crouched down here and there among the jutting dunes of sand. The only one to stand her ground was Alcinous' daughter, so he quickly used his cunning and spoke to her with soothing language. O oh, divine queen, I come here as a supp suppliant to you. Are you a goddess or a mortal being? If you're one of the gods who hold wide heaven, then I think you, are, you most resemble Artemis, daughter of great Zeus, in your loveliness, your stature, and your shape. If you're human, one of those mortals living on the earth, your father and noble mother are thrice blessed, and thrice blessed your brothers too. In their hearts they must glow with pleasure for you always when they see a child like you moving up into the dance. 
but the happiest heart more so than all the rest belongs to him who with his wedding gifts will lead you home. But great distress has overtaken me. Yesterday, my 20th day afloat, I skipped a wine-dark sea. Before that, waves and swift-driving storm winds carried me from Wajigia Island. But, Divine Queen, have pity. You're the first one I've approached after going through so much grief. I don't know any other people, none of those who hold the city in its land. Show me the town. Give me some rag to throw around my, myself. Perhaps some wrapping you had for the clothes. White-armed Nausicaa then answered him and said, Stranger, you don't seem to be a wicked man or foolish. Olympian Zeus himself gives happiness to bad and worthy men, each one receiving just what Zeus desires. But now you reach our land and city. You'll not lack clothing, clothes, or any other thing. We owe a hard supplement we meet. I'll show the town to you, and I'll tell you what our country's called. The Phaeacians own this city and this land. As for me, I'm the daughter of brave Alcinous. Phaeacian power and strength depend on him. Nausicaa finished speaking. Then she called out to her fair-haired attendant, Stand up, you girls. Have you run off because you've seen a man? Surely you don't think he is an enemy. So, my girls, give the stranger food and drink. Then bathe him in the river in a place where there is some shelter from the wind. Nausicaa finished. They stood up and called out to one another. Then they took Odysseus aside to a shelter spot, following what Nausicaa, daughter of Great Heart Elsinous, had ordered. They set out clothing for him, a cloak and tunic, and gave him the gold flask full of smooth olive oil. They told him to bathe there in the flowing river. When he'd washed himself all over and rubbed on oil, he put on clothes the unmarried girl had given him. Then Odysseus went to sit some distance off beside the shore, glowing with charm and beauty. Nausicaa gazed at him in admiration. They set out food and drink before resourceful Lord Odysseus. He ate and drank voraciously. Many days had passed since he last tasted food. Then white-armed Nausicaa thought of something else. She folded up the clothes, put them in the handsome wagon, harnessed up the strong hooved mules, and climbed up by herself. She called out to Odysseus, then spoke to him. Get up now, stranger, and go to the city. I'll take you to my wise father's house, where, I tell you, you will get to meet all the finest Phaeacians. You seem to me to have good sense, so act as follows. While we are moving to the countryside past men's farms, walk fast with my attendants behind the mules and wagon. I'll lead the way. You'll come across a fine grove to Athena. It's near the road, a clump of poplar trees. There's a fountain with meadows all around. My father has fertile vineyard there, and some land, too, within shouting distance of the town. Sit down there and wait a while until we move into the city and reach my father's house. When you think we've had time to reach my home, then go in the city of the Phaeacians and inquire about my father's house, great-hearted Alphanuus. Once inside the house and in the courtyard, move through the great hall quickly till you reach my mother, Arete, seated by the fire against a pillar spinning purple yarn. A marvelous sight. Servants sit behind, behind her. If her heart and mind are well disposed to you, then there's hope you'll see your friends and reach your well-built house in your own native land. Saying this, Nausicaa cracked the shining whip and struck the mules. They quickly left the flowing river, moving briskly forward at a rapid pace. Using her judgment with the whip, she drove on so Odysseus and her servants could keep on foot. Just at sunset, they reached a celebrated grove, sacred to Athena. Lord Odysseus sat down there and made a quick prayer to great Zeus's daughter.